28 minutes past one. I was told once in Sunday school that a church tower reaches up skywards because it is a promise of heaven. Church towers are different in France. It was the first thing I noticed when I came here, when I changed my world of home for my world of war. In comparison, the church towers at home seem almost squat, hiding themselves away in the folds of the fields. Here, there are no folds in the fields, only wide open plains, scarcely a hill in sight. And instead of church towers, they have spires that thrust themselves skywards like a child putting his hand up in class, longing to be noticed. But God, if there is one, notices nothing here. He has long since abandoned this place, and all of us who live in it. There are not many steeples left now. I have seen the one in Albert, hanging down like a broken promise. Now I come to think of it, it was a broken promise that brought me here, to France, and now to this barn. The mouse is back again. That's good. There was a brief time just after we'd found Big Joe, when all old hurts and grudges seemed suddenly to be forgiven and forgotten. Forgotten, too, was all talk of the war in France. No one spoke of anything that day except our search for Big Joe and its happy outcome. Even the colonel and the wolf woman were celebrating with the rest of us up in the Duke. Marley's mother and father were there, too, celebrating with everyone else and smiling, though being strict chapel people, they didn't touch a drop of drink. I'd never seen Molly's mother smile before that. And then the colonel announced that he was paying for all the drinks. It wasn't long. It only took a couple of points before Farmer Cox began singing. He was still singing when we left. Some of the songs were getting a bit rude by then. I was there outside the Duke when Mother went up and thanked the colonel for his help. He offered us all a lift home in his Rolls Royce. The Peacefuls in the back of the colonel's car and the Wolfman in the front being friendly. We couldn't believe it. And after all the bad blood between us over the years. The colonel broke the spell on the way home, talking about the war, and how the army should be using more cavalry over in France. Horses and guns, he said, in that order. That's how we beat the Boers in South Africa. That's what they should be doing. If I were younger, I'd go myself. They'll soon be needing every horse they can find, Mrs. Peaceful, and every man, too. It's not going at all well out there. Mother thanked him again as he helped us out of the car outside our gate. The colonel touched his hat and smiled. Don't you go running off again, young man, he said to Big Joe. You gave us all a terrible fright. And even the wolf woman waved at us almost cheerily as they drove off. That night, Big Joe began coughing. He caught a chill, and it had gone to his lungs. He was in bed with a fever for weeks afterwards, and Mother hardly left his side, she was so worried. By the time he was better, the whole episode of his disappearance had been forgotten, overtaken by news in the papers of a great and terrible battle on the Marne, where our armies were fighting the Germans to a standstill, trying desperately to halt their advance through France. One evening, Charlie and I arrived home from work a little late, having stopped on the way for a drink at the Duke, as we often did. In those days, I remember, I had to pretend I liked the beer. The truth was I ate at this stuff but I love the company. Charlie might have bossed me about on the farm, but after work, up at the Duke, he never treated me like the fifteen-year-old I was, though some of the others did. I couldn't have them knowing that I hated beer, so I'd forced down a couple of points with Charlie, and often left the Duke a little befuddled in the head. That was why I was woozy when we came home that evening. When I opened the door and saw Molly sitting there on the floor with her head in Mother's lap, it seemed I was suddenly back to the day Big Joe had gone missing. Molly looked up at us, and I could see that she had been crying, and at this time it was Mother doing the comforting. What is it? Charlie asked. What's happened? You may well ask, Charlie Peaceful, Mother said. She didn't sound at all pleased to see us. I wondered at first if she had seen we'd been drinking. Then I noticed a leather suitcase under the window sill and Molly's coat over the back of Father's fireside chair. Molly's come to stay, Mother went on. They've thrown her out, Charlie. Her mother and father have thrown her out, and it's your fault. No, Molly cried. Don't say that. 
It isn't his fault. It's no one's fault. She ran over to Charlie and threw herself into his arms. What's that, Mo? asked Charlie. What's going on? Molly was shaking her head as she wept uncontrollably now on his shoulder. He looked at Mother. What's going on, Charlie? Is that she's going to have your baby, she said. They packed her case, put her out the door, and told her never to come back. I never want to see her again. She had nowhere else to go, Charlie. I said she was family, that she belongs with us now, that she can stay as long as she likes. It seemed an age before Charlie said anything. I saw his face go through all manner of emotions, incomprehension, bewilderment, outrage, through all of these at once, and then at last a resolve. He held Molly away from him now, and brushed away her tears with his thumb as he looked steadily into her eyes. When he spoke at last, it wasn't to Molly, but to Mother. You shouldn't have said that to Mol, Mother. He spoke slowly, almost sternly. Then he began to smile. That was for me to say. It's our baby. My baby. And Mol's my girl. So I should have said it. But I'm glad you said it all the same. After that, Molly became even more one of us than she had been before. I was both overjoyed and miserable at the same time. Molly and Charlie knew how I must have felt, I think, but they never spoke of it, and neither did I. They were married up in the church a short time later. It was a very empty church. There was no one there except the vicar and the four of us, and the vicar's wife sitting at the back. Everyone knew about Molly's baby by now, and because of that the vicar had only agreed to marry them on certain conditions— that no bells would he be rung, and no hymns to be sung. He rushed through the marriage service as if he wanted to be somewhere else. There was no wedding feast afterwards, only a cup of tea and some fruitcake when we got home. Shortly afterwards, Mother received a letter from the wolf woman, saying it had been a marriage of shame. How she had thought of dismissing Molly, and only decided against it because whilst Molly was clearly a weak and immoral girl— she felt she could not in all conscience punish Molly for something that she was sure was much more Charlie's fault than hers, and that anyway, Molly had already been punished enough for her wickedness. Mother read the letter out loud to all of us, then scrunched it up and threw it into the fire, where it belonged, she said. I moved into Big Joe's room and slept with him in his bed, which wasn't easy because he was big and the bed very narrow. He muttered to himself loudly in his dreams, and tossed and turned almost constantly. But as I lay awake at nights, that was not what troubled me most. In the next room slept the two people I most loved in all the world, who in finding each other had deserted me. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I thought of them lying in each other's arms, and I wanted to hate them. But I couldn't. All I knew was that I had no place at home anymore that I will be better off away, and away from them in particular. I tried never to be alone with Molly, for I did not know what to say to her any more. I didn't stop to drink with Charlie any more at the Duke for the same reason. On the farm I took every opportunity that came my way to work my own, so as to be nowhere near him. I volunteered for any fetching and carrying that had to be done away from the farm. Farmer Cox seemed more than happy for me to do that. He was always singing me off with a horse and cart and some errand or other, bringing back feed from the merchants, maybe, fetching the seed potatoes, or perhaps taking a pig to market to sell for him. Whatever it was, I took my time about it, and Farmer Cox never seemed to notice. But Charlie did. He said I was skiving off work, but he knew that all I was doing was avoiding him. We knew each other so well. We never argued, not really. Perhaps it was because neither of us wanted to hurt the other. We both knew enough hurt had been done already. That Mora would only widen the rift between us, and neither of us wanted that. It was while I was off skiving in Hatherley Market one morning that I came face to face with the war for the first time, a war that until now had seemed unreal and distant to all of us, a war only in newspapers and on posters. I'd just sold Farmer Cox's two old rams and got a good price for them, too, when I heard the sound of a band coming down the high street, drums pounding, bugles blaring, everyone in the market went running, and so did I. As I came round the corner, I saw them. 
Behind the band there must have been a couple of dozen soldiers, splendid in their scarlet uniforms. They marched past me, arms swinging in perfect time, buttons and boots shining, the sun glinting on their bayonets. They were singing along with the band. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. And I remember thinking it was a good thing Big Joe wasn't there, because he'd have been bound to join in with his oranges and lemons. Children were stomping alongside them, some in paper hats, some with wooden sticks over their shoulders. And there were women throwing flowers, roses mostly, that were falling at the soldiers' feet. But one of them landed on a soldier's tunic and somehow stuck there. I saw him smile at that. Like everyone else, I followed them round the town and up into the square. The band played God Save the King, and then, with the Union Jack fluttering behind him, the first sergeant major I'd ever set eyes on got up on the steps of the cross, slipped his stick smartly under his arm, and spoke to us, his voice unlike any voice I'd heard before, rasping, commanding. I shan't beat about the bush, ladies and gentlemen, he began. I shan't tell you it's all tickety-boo out there in France. There's been too much of that nonsense already, in my view. I've been there. I've seen it for myself. So I'll tell you straight. It's no picnic. It's hard slog, that's what it is. Hard slog. Only one question to ask yourself about this war. Who would you rather see marching through your streets? Us lot or the Hun? Make up your minds, because mark my words, ladies and gentlemen. If we don't sort them out in France, the Germans will be here. Right here in Hatherley. Right here on your doorstep. I could feel the silence all around. They'll come marching through here, burning your houses, killing your children, and yes, violating your women. They've beaten brave little Belgium, swallowed her up in one gulp, and now they've taken a fair slice of France, too. I'm here to tell you that unless we beat them at their own game, they'll gobble us up as well. His eyes raked over us. Well? Do you want the hunt here? Do you? No, came the shout, and I was shouting along with them. Shall we knock the stuffing out of the men? Yes, we roared in unison. The sergeant major nodded. Good, very good. Then we shall need you. He was pointing his stick now into the crowd, picking out the men. You, and you, and you. He was looking straight at me now, into my eyes. And you too, my lad. Until that very moment, it had honestly never occurred to me that what he was saying had anything to do with me. I had been an onlooker. No longer. Your king needs you, your country needs you, and all the brave lads out in France need you too. His face broke into a smile as he fingered his immaculate moustache. And remember one thing, lads, and I can vouch for this, all the girls love a soldier. The ladies in the crowd all laughed and giggled at that. Then the sergeant major returned the stick under his arm. So we'll be the first brave lad to come up and take the king's shilling. No one moved. No one spoke up. Who'll lead the way? Come along now. Don't let me down, lads. I'm looking for boys with hearts of oak, lads who love their king and their country, brave boys who hate the lousy Hun. That was the moment the first one stepped forward, flourishing his hat as he pushed his way through the cheering crowd. I knew him at once from school. It was big Jimmy Parsons. I hadn't seen him for a while, not since his family had moved away from the village. He was even bigger than I remembered. Fuller in the face and neck, and redder, too. He was showing off now, just like he always had done in the schoolyard. Egged on by the crowd, others soon followed. Suddenly, someone prodded me hard in the small of my back. It was a toothless old lady pointing at me with her crooked finger. Go on, son, she croaked. You go and fight. It's every man's duty to fight when his country calls, that's why you say. Go on. You ain't a coward, are you? Everyone seemed to be looking at me then urging me on, their eyes accusing me as I hesitated. The toothless old lady jabbed me again, and then she was pushing me forward. You ain't a coward, are you? You ain't a coward! I didn't run, not at first. I sidled away from her slowly, and then backed out of the crowd hoping no one would notice me. But she did. Chicken! She screamed after me. Chicken! Then I did run. I ran, helter-skelter down the deserted high street, her words still ringing in my ears. As I drove the cart out of the market, I heard the band strike up again in the square, heard the echoing thump, thump of the big bass drum calling me back to the flag. Filled with shame, I kept on going. All the way back to the farm, I thought about the toothless old lady, 
about what she had said, what the sergeant major had said. I thought about how fine and manly the men looked in their bright uniforms, how Molly would admire me, might even love me if I joined up and came home in my scarlet uniform, how proud Mother would be, and Big Joe. By the time I was unhitching the horse back at the farm, I was quite determined that I would do it. I would be a soldier. I would go to France, and like the sergeant major said, kick the stuffing out of the lousy Germans. I made up my mind I would break the news to everyone at supper. I couldn't wait to tell them, to see the look on their faces. We barely sat down before I began. I was in Hatherley this morning, I said. Mr. Cox sent me to market. Skiving as usual, Charlie muttered into his soup. I ignored him and went on. The army was there, mother. Recruiting they were. Jimmy Parsons joined up. Lots of others, too. More full them, Charlie said. I'm not going. Not ever. I'll shoot a rat because it might bite me. I'll shoot a rabbit because I can eat it. Why would I even want to shoot a German? Never even met a German. Mother picked up my spoon and handed it to me. Eat, she said, and she patted my arm. And don't worry about it, Tomo. They can't make you go. You're too young anyway. I'm nearly sixteen, I said. You gotta be seventeen, said Charlie. They won't let you join unless you are. They don't want boys. So I ate my soup and said no more about it. I was disappointed at first that I hadn't had my big moment. But as I lay in bed that night, I was secretly more than a little relieved that I wouldn't be going off to the war, and that by the time I was seventeen, it would be all over anyway, as like as not. A few weeks later, the colonel paid Mother a surprise visit, whilst Charlie and I were out at work. We didn't hear about it until we got home in the evening and Molly told us. I thought something strange was going on, as Mother was unusually preoccupied and quiet at supper. She wouldn't even answer Big Joe's questions. Then when Molly got up, saying she felt like a walk, and suggested both Charlie and I came with her, I knew for sure something was up. It was a very long time since we'd been out together, just the three of us. If Charlie had asked me, I'd have said no for sure. But it was always more difficult for me to refuse Molly. We went down to the brook, just like we'd done in the old days whenever we'd wanted to be alone together, where Molly and I had met up so often when I'd been their go-between postman. Molly didn't tell us until we were sitting either side of her on the river bank, until she had taken each of us by the hand. I'm breaking a promise I made to your mother, she began. I so much don't want to tell you this, but I must. You have to know what's going on. It's the colonel. He came in and told her this morning. He said he was only doing what he called his patriotic duty. He told us that the war was going badly for us, that the country was crying out for men. So we've decided that now is the time for every able-bodied man who lives or works in his estate, everyone who can be spared, to volunteer, to go off to the war and do his bit for king and country. The estate will just have to manage without them for a while. I felt Molly's grip tighten on my hand, and a tremor came into her voice. He said you've got to go, Charlie or else he won't let us stay on in the cottage. Your mother protested all she could, but he wouldn't listen. He just lost his temper. He'll put us out, Charlie, and he won't go on employing your mother or me unless you go. He wouldn't do that, Mal. It's just a threat, Charlie said. He can't do that. He just can't. He would, Molly replied, and he can. You know he can. And when the colonel gets it into his head to do something and he's in the mood to do it, he will. Look what he did to Bertha. He means it, Charlie. But the colonel promised, I said. And his wife did, too, before she died. She said she wanted Mother looked after. And the colonel said we could stay on in the cottage. Mother told us. Your mother reminded him of that, I replied. And do you know what he said? He said it had never been a promise as such, only his wife's wish. And that anyway, the war had changed everything. He was making no exceptions. Charlie has to join up. Or we'll be out of the cottage at the end of the month. We sat there, holding hands, Molly's head on Charlie's shoulder as evening fell around us. Molly was sobbing quietly from time to time, but none of us spoke. We didn't need to. We all knew there was no way out of this, that the war was breaking us apart, and that all our lives would be changed forever. But at that moment, I treasured Molly's hand in mine, treasured this last time together. Suddenly, Charlie broke the silence. I'll be honest, Mal, he said. It's been bothering me a lot just lately. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to go. But I've seen the list in the papers. 
You know, all the killed and the wounded. Poor beggars. Pages of them. Hardly seems right, does it? Me being here, enjoying life while they're over there. It's not all bad, Mall. I saw Benny Copleston yesterday. He was sporting his uniform up at the pub. He's back on leave. He's been a year or more out in Belgium. He says it's all right. Cushy, he called it. He says we've got the Germans on the run now. One big push, he reckons. Then we'll be running back to Berlin with their tails between their legs. And then all our boys can come home. He paused and kissed Molly on the forehead. Anyway, looks like you haven't got much choice, have I, Mall? Oh, Charlie, Molly whispered. I don't want you to go. Don't worry, girl, Charlie said. With a bit of luck, I'll be back to wet the baby's head, and Tomo will look after you. You'll be the man about the place, won't you, Tomo? And if that silly old fart of a colonel sticks his lousy head in our front door again when I'm gone, shoot the bastard, Tomo, like he shot Bertha. And I knew he was only half joking, too. I don't believe I even thought about what I said next. I'm not staying, I told them. I'm coming with you, Charlie. They both tried all they could to dissuade me. They argued, they bullied, but I would not be put off, not this time. I was too young, Charlie said. I said I was sixteen in a couple of weeks, and as tall as he was, that all I had to do was shave and talk deeper, and I could easily be taken for seventeen. Mother wouldn't let me go, Molly said. I said I'd run away, that she couldn't lock me up. And who'll be here to look after us if you both go? Molly was pleading with me now. Who would you rather I look after, Molly? I replied. All of you at home who can perfectly well look after yourselves, or Charlie, who's always getting himself into nasty scrapes, even at home. And they had no answer to this. They knew I'd won, and I knew it too. I was going to fight in a war with Charlie. Nothing, and no one could stop me now. I've had two long years to think on why I decided like that, on the spur of the moment to go with Charlie. In the end, I suppose, it was because I couldn't bear the thought of being apart from him. We'd lived our lives always together, shared everything, even our love for Molly. Maybe I just didn't want him to have this adventure without me. And then there was that spark in me newly kindled by those scarlet soldiers marching bravely up the ice street in Atherley, the steady march of their feet, the drums and bugles resounding through the town, the sergeant major stirring call to arms. Perhaps he had woken in me feelings I never realized I'd had before, and that I certainly never talked about. It was true that I did love all that was familiar to me. I loved what I knew, and what I knew was my family, and Molly, and the countryside I'd grown up in. I did not want any enemy soldier ever setting foot on our soil, on my place. I would do all I could to stop him, and to protect the people I loved, and I would be doing it with Charlie. Deep down, though, I knew that, more than Charlie, more than my country, or the band, or the sergeant major, it was that toothless old woman taunting me in the square. You ain't a coward, are you? You ain't a coward. Truth was, but I wasn't sure I wasn't. And I needed to find out. I had to prove myself. I had to prove myself to myself. Two days later, two days of parrying Mother's many attempts to keep me from going, we all went off together to Eggersford Junction Station where Charlie and I were to catch the train to Exeter. Big Joe had not been told anything about us going off to war. We were going away for a while, and we'd be back soon. We didn't tell him the truth, but we told him no lies either. Mother and Molly tried not to cry because of him. So did we. Look after Charlie for me, Tomo, Molly said. And look after yourself, too. I could feel the swell of her belly against me as we hugged. Mother told me to promise to keep clean, to be good, to write home, and to come home. Then Charlie and I were on the train, the first train we'd ever been on in our lives, and we were leaning out of the window and waving, only pulling back, spluttering and coughing when we were engulfed suddenly in a cloud of sooty smoke. When it cleared and we looked out again, the station was already out of sight. We sat down opposite each other. Thanks, Tomo, said Charlie. For what? I said. You know, he replied, and we both looked out of the window. There was no more to say about it. A heron lifted off the river and accompanied us for a while before veering away from us and landing high in the trees. A startled herd of ruby-red cows scattered as we passed by, tails high as they ran. 
Then we were in a tunnel, a long, dark tunnel filled with din and smoke and blackness. It seems like I've been in that tunnel every day since. So Charlie and I went rattling off to war. It all seems a very long time ago now. A lifetime. <laughs>